okay. So if I share my screen with you all, Music of Eternity, the mighty symphony of the triune God. I also was very struck by the language of the message, a translation of the Bible, and this psalm in particular, which is quoted um, within the uh, text that we were looking at. So I thought we would use this as a preface to our opening prayer this evening. Once again, I'll go over what God has done, lay out on the table the ancient wonders. I'll ponder all the things you've accomplished and give a long loving look at your acts. Oh God, your way is holy. No God is great like God. You're the God who makes things happen. Let us pray. Before the tremendous throne of your majesty, at the exalted place of your divinity, the majestic seat of your glory, and the sublime throne of your sovereignty, where your servants, the cherubim, continuously sing hymns, and where your glorifiers, the seraphim, sing unce unceasingly the sanctus, we bow down with fear, adore with trembling, Give thanks and glorify you without ceasing at all times, O Lord of the universe, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for all ages. Amen. The Melodies of God. I wanted us to just think for a moment about a very popular metaphor that is used in theological circles to try and describe the Trinity to learning and budding theologians. The Trinity is often described as a symphony, a harmony, the combination of different chords. And when you think about how music travels, how it speaks and sings and moves people, you can begin to see why the Trinity as a piece of music where different chords weave into one another to create a harmony is a popular metaphor. And therefore it may be asked, if the triune God is the conductor of an orchestra, are we the instruments? I want to share with you something that Clemens of Alexandria once wrote. We humans are a musical instrument of the Logos who made us harmonious through the Holy Spirit so that the divine harmony may resound in us, that we may receive and worship the word, and that the spirit may blow us similar to a pipe, giving us life and making us an instrument of praise. Being the divine image of the Logos, moreover, we participate in the Trinitarian communion when we become an instrument of the Logos's praise to the Father. The Trinitarian interpretation is supported for Clemens by the divine word as the only instrument of peace and the only logos through whom we honour God. And I found this picture here. Can anybody work out what it might be of? I'll tell you. This is an image by a Romanian photographer called Adrian Border, and it is the inside of a cello the inside of an instrument where the light, I don't know what these things are called, but where the light is shining in through the gaps that are on the, the top of it and the place inside where the music and the sound is made. But this little book that we're looking at for Advent takes the idea of music as metaphor a little bit further where the triune God is his own instrument. And rather than us being concerned with the sound we make, we are to be attentive to his melodies in our midst. Now, William Blake sketched this very famous image of the triune God, where the father holds the Christ and over whom the spirit broods. Much analysis of this image takes place by focusing on the three figures. But this evening, I'd like you to look instead at the frame, at the movement all around the Trinity, 
the vibration, the melodies, the ruach, the breath, the heartbeat, all perhaps found in the swirls of the wind, the rising sun stretching its light, the undercurrents and overcurrents, all created by the activity of the triune God, the triune God's secret symphonies. And when it comes to thinking about the secret symphonies of the divine, I wonder whether nature can give us some help. And so here are a few snippets of a few songs that we don't hear and yet are being played and received in different spheres of our universe. How about the sounds from space?
next, I'd like to share with you the sound of these pulsars and the different beats that they make. Be, um, this does have flickering images. So if, um, if that does affect you, please close your eyes and then I will let you know when the flickering has passed by. It seems to me that the cre whole of our creation is full of secret symphonies, melodies, heartbeats, rhythms and patterns, which when slowed down or taken into new fields of vision or at speeds that are different to human um, normality, reveal something about the pattern of our creation. And so therefore perhaps the idea of a triune God speaking with a melody of which we simply need to find the right ears to listen to may be a very apt metaphor. In the little book that we are reading, there is a quote from Lucy Christine, who says that when the voice of God called her, it was at one and the same time a light, a drawing and a power. And Evelyn Underhill asks, what is that supernal symphony of which this elusive music with its three complementary strains forms part, we cannot know. As we come to our life comes to maturity, she continues, we discover to our confusion that human ears can pick up from the infinite many incompatible tunes, but we can't hear the whole symphony. And the melody confided, confided to our care, the one which we alone perhaps can contribute, and which taxes our powers to the full, has in it not only the notes of triumph, but the notes of pain. There are unsuspected deeps and great spiritual forces which condition and control our small lives. And so the spiritual life, which is profoundly organic, means the give and take, the willed correspondence of the little human spirit with the infinite spirit exactly here where it is. And so we are asked in the book to which wit can we detect the melodies of God playing in our own life or that of others. And if so, what helps you to recognize these? And so I'm going to exit the screen so that we can have a conversation about what might the melodies in our lives be and be about.
maybe it would help by first asking <clears throat> what music has lifted you towards the triune god what music has elevated your consciousness or lifted you out of where you are or what you're doing and can you explain why that is do feel free to unmute yourself if you wish to speak i think um for me very often it's um it's natural sounds like bird song um is a is a big part of that especially the when the different bird song replicates the different seasons for example this time of year you'll hear a thin reedy song but very beautiful song and that, and that is the robin which is one of the few birds that sings regularly at this time of year and that always lifts me um because it feels like you're listening you're not just listening to a bird singing you're listening to something that represents such a lot about the world about the changing seasons and and the seeing the of god being behind all of that it very much feels i feel drawn to god when i hear that sound and other sounds of different birds at different times of the year thank you yeah i i i i, I, I can relate to that a lot because um i often find um if i'm outside in the garden uh, at twilight um, we have owls all around us different kinds of owls I, I should say that I, I live in the village in Bishopstone and there are actually quite a lot of woods around our garden um, and it's it's very very special and magical uh, being outside and then you hear these owls and other sounds just just as the light is fading and a, a real sense of peace invades you without ever even probably you know I wouldn't necessarily have related this to um, anything religious actually but it's making me think about that <laughs> this conversation is making me make that that connection but certainly it's it's really calming and, I, and it's some it's a time when I, I I love to be outside at that time thank you yeah I think I'd add to that in, say, the other end of the day, morning, to the dawn chorus. Um, I've heard it several times, I guess we all have. But I often thought, you know, why, why would birds do that? Because you can hear them from miles, can't you? All sorts of birds. And you, you, you can hear them then when you can't hear them uh, during the day when there's all sorts of noise. We make a lot of noise and you just can't hear them. But why would they do that? Um, so I agree with you, sort of peaceful at the end of the day, but also as a sort of celebration, isn't it, that chorus? Amazing celebration. And I've never thought of it quite that way, so thanks. I'm struck by the fact that when, um, over the last two Easters, for the, um, we've, we've had a sunrise service outside, one of which was in the corner of the rectory garden and then last year in the churchyard. And the amazing thing about that was that we were blessed with this natural choir who were all up in the trees accompanying the whole thing. And there was something about having that beautiful sound within our liturgy was just so connected with, between the creator and his creation in a, in a way that's really quite tangible. And of course, is mirrored in the, the presence of God in the bread and the wine. You know, it's in the elementals, it's in the, the created matter of our world that the God that our God makes himself known. Yes, I would say when I first did breathing space with you and it was in the rectory garden, again, it was the learning, it was the bird song that sort of gave you something where somebody was, I was new to, um, to breathing space and silence and meditation like that. And the bird song gave me something to focus on. And, th and that, that's how I, got, I sort of got into breathing space. And I, I just, you know, it, it, it surprised me how powerful I found the silence and everything. And then you hear the noise, you hear the sounds. Yeah. Well, the sounds of nature, I suppose, yes. Jane. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> James so I, was just, I was just going to say that um, when I hear unaccompanied singing, like polyphony, the old, uh, you know, church singing, cathedral singing, and even a cappella, 
it is just like it is it maybe it's human bird song it feels like it comes from the soul and the, I, I just love old choirs you know it makes me feel very elevated thank you Angela yeah I was just thinking about the sounds of nature and um I live on quite a busy road with a lot of traffic so I don't often get to hear them but um, sometimes if I'm really lucky about one in the morning when I'm lying in bed I can hear the waves of the sea oh, um, and that that's absolutely gorgeous I also get to hear the sound of the church bells coming from St Leonard's in the town and that elevates me as well um, but also I was kind of really what Jane was saying was resonating there as well the polyphonic style and the, at the moment it's a really nice opportunity this time of year I find that I dig out medieval music there's lots of gorgeous medieval carols um, and you know just really any bits of music it can be folk it can be classical um, I remember feeling very lifted when I first heard a piece called The Westminster Mass by Roxana Panufnik when I was, I was in my 20s when I first heard that and it's it's amazing if you haven't heard it please get it um, it, it, it just for me it really lifted my my spirits and my soul so it, it can be a real mix yeah thank you okay yes I I'm I agree absolutely with the bird song. And what's amazing about bird song is it, it's different as well, isn't it? The different birds sing slightly different songs. So once you're tuned into listening, you start to think, oh, that must be a robin. And I don't always recognize them all. But the other thing I was going to say was that right at the beginning of the pandemic, I, I uh, listened to Andrew Bocelli singing outside Milan Cathedral. And he sang, he, he sang Amazing Grace. Just a single person was, and he sang, of course, was blind, but now I see. And he was singing it for the world as a, as a kind of prayer. And uh, it was really powerful because it wasn't done as a performance. It was done as a, as a real offering. A, you know, like a universal prayer. And I often play it on, it's on YouTube and I often play it because it's so powerful because in the front of Milan Cathedral, he's so small. I mean, isn't that small, but he's small compared to and alone in front of this magnificent building. It's very powerful. So any kind of music, I think particularly church music is, uh, and now we can sing in church at the moment, which is amazing. Mm. And actually, that's um, that's a really good point, Kay. You know, when the church is first sung again, mm. everybody literally came out of church skipping. You know, they did. Yeah, there's something about singing and music that plays in a different part of the body and the mind and the soul. And mm. certainly, as we know from our work with the care homes, you know, music is it, profoundly it, absolutely profound. Yeah, important. it is resurrects a past in a matter of seconds it does. it does it does and I was also because I was writing this article for Cross Keys about St Cecilia the patron saint of musicians I, I was researching the history of music and it go they reckon it goes right back to prehistoric times but of course it expanded once the notation came and they, they could print it and so on and it could be spread but it seems an instinctive thing for human beings to relate to music and create harmonies and rhythms and so on. Yeah. When I was in Cambridge, I had the um, incredible privilege of being able to go to the Parker Library. Um, and right. in the Parker Library, they have the very first musical notation that was ever. Oh, and the way in which and, and how it how it was 
was that literally the word was written going up or down the five lines so that you could see where the, the word would needed to be sung higher or lower. Higher or lower. And over oh, time wow. that emerged into yes. being, I think, the actual sort of, you know, the symbols and everything that it is. But it was just so simple. And it was all about this intonation, this tune, this melody, mm. that somehow mm. mapping these words onto it. The most beautiful document, one of the most beautiful documents I've ever seen. Um, quite extraordinary. Um, so often, many of you, hands up if you if you know Richard Raw's work. I wonder if you know Richard Raw's work. Yeah, yes. a yeah, a little bit. So Richard Raw <clears throat> um, is a Roman Catholic, um, and he is on the more sort of liberal end of the, the theological spectrum. And some people are quite sniffy about him because, um, because he can be a bit free with his thinking. However, he wrote a book called The Dance of the Trinity. And the idea of the Trinity as a dance is a very is more popular, is one of the most popular metaphors because it captures this sense of movement um, and the interchange between three characters, you know, strictly come dancing, but with three of them perhaps, um, whirling around or slowing down or, you know, um, going through the different sort of movements, but actually being in some synchronicity with one another, but actually being separate parts playing their own part. Uh, and this is really popular and, and it comes from a word called perichoresis, which is the Greek word for the relationship between the three members of the Trinity. Um, and perichoresis is, um, is often translated as dance. Um, I, I'm not very good with my Greek, but um, I understand that to be the case. Um, the, one of the closest translations is, is related to dance. But I wonder, do you think music is a more helpful metaphor for the Trinity or dance? It's, it's an interesting one, that because one of the things I was going to say earlier is that um, we, um, it's been like that stuff that the, the images of space where we can't hear those sounds. And there's something mm. about if you can't hear the music, but you can see the dance. And there's something there about the, the movement of the stars and planets through the night sky, for example, that follow a regular pattern, a regular dance through the sky, but we can't hear any of the sounds behind that. So in some ways, sometimes dance is easier because we see that around us all the time we see everything happening and moving in that way and um and music is a is in a way is almost more ethereal isn't it than dance it's harder mm. to get a proper, proper grasp on perhaps so but i mean they're both really good metaphors so I, i'd hate to have to choose one and lose the other but there's something then a little bit more mystical isn't there about the fact that you can't physically see it but it's there you know, with the movement of the planets and so on, because I, I was watching the Brian Cox um, series, as I said to you before, and although I didn't understand a lot of it, I, I was very taken, and I was very taken by Evelyn Underhill, because she talked about before the stellar universe. So, you know, it's amazing that she was relating to uh, almost pre what we know, uh, if you see what I mean, whereas in, I think with the dance, it's something that we all instinctively do, but it's often related to music, isn't it? When you, when you dance, you have music, you dance to music, don't you? Yeah. Mainly. Yeah, actually, can you dance without it? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Um, do you think that, say, talking about dance in relation to the Trinity um, makes you visualise a sort of incarnation because you need a body to dance? And that's what I get most strongly from that, the idea of the three dancing and interweaving. And um, it reminds me, you know, that it's not just out there. So there's something about the tangibility of dance. Would that be yeah, physical, like the physicality of it? Mm. Yeah. In, it's an incarnation of those uh, spirits. Did, did, did you see that <laughs> um, uh, Strictly Come Dancing? There's somebody now on it who um, is, is severely hearing impaired. Oh, I mean, yes. She can't hear at all, I don't think, mm. or hardly at all. And, um, you know, there's this couple's choice thing where they choose their dance. And she they did it was a very beautiful dance she and she's very graceful in fact 
and they switched off the music for mm. a section of it. Yeah, it was amazing. So I actually thought that's, you know, something spiritual in popular culture, really. I thought it, I thought it, it was really, really powerful. And obviously it was good raising people's awareness of what it's like not to be able to hear. Um, but it was more than that, you know, mm. it's just such, such a beautiful dance. Um, and the way she is with Giovanni Panici, they seem to have linked in quite a special way, don't they? Yes, yes. Um, yeah. And it's something to do with, she can somehow ever pick up rhythm even by, you know, by touch rather than by hearing. Yes, and it seems, you know, she has to really concentrate. Mm. really focus and I, I thought in a way that's a, that is a sort of spiritual message you know that, that one it, it doesn't just come to you you know you have to yes really focus to hear that's, what what, yeah. what is in this text to hear the music that, that this text is talking about yeah. um, and I, you know as we do in the breathing space and other places do you have moments? Yeah. Oh, Jeff, go on. Sorry, no, sorry. Um, I, I think um, for me that the sort of chapter that we read, I mean, seemed to sort of say that our spirits, you know, were sort of so sort of small, and you know, there's this massive, great, you know, God and Trinity. Um, and I, I just something you were saying that sort of struck me that maybe it's the spirits that are dancing. You know, they're all maybe that's it because. Um, I'm a rotten dancer. I wouldn't I'd hate to think. I'd hate to think that you know I'd have to start dancing, but maybe I will. Who knows? Who knows? I think one of the lovely things about Richard Raw's work is that this dance isn't just between the three of them, but actually it's a dance that they are constantly inviting others to come and join in with. So it's the dynamism and the expansiveness of the Trinity. That what the Trinity wants is not to relate for its own sake. But it, what, it is a relationship in order to sweep others into its relationship. And I wonder whether, I, I'm just thinking about Teze and, or, or any sort of chant, actually, any sort of simple chant. And it always begins small, doesn't it? It always begins with those two or three who are really confident with the tune and the words. And of course, it repeats and it sort of builds, but it builds and builds and builds. And if you let it go long enough, everyone will be singing it. It catches everyone in its in its in its melody, in its um, in its prayer. And I wonder if if the Trinity is a melody, the Triune God is a melody. Then the point of that is so that others will join in with with that song somehow, um, which I think is um, is quite an intriguing, intriguing challenge, really. So was this bit about, wasn't it about, you have to move um, from, he, he was talking, she was talking about from the mine to ours, so making it much more, it's not only that you perceive it in yourself, but it's about reaching out and, in, in, and joining in with others in some way, or connecting with others in a, in a perhaps a mystical way, I don't know. That, that reminds me that um, when we have breathing space, which is literally just the sitting and keeping of silence, all of us will say, can't do this at home on my own. <laughs> it's yeah. really difficult to do it on your own. But actually, when we sit in a group, particularly when we sit in a circle, um, it's far, far easier to sit and attend to the divine in silence. So maybe that's, you know, that's a move from mine to ours. Isn't mm. it? It's mm. um, actually quite significant, I think. Mm. So I wonder whether the challenge of this particular chapter is actually what happens next. Having had this conversation and having spoken about the melody of God in our world and our difficulty with hearing it and, and wanting to see it with our eyes because that's somehow easier. But I wonder whether just knowing that there is a melody of God is actually the first, the first step. You know, who knows over this coming week, you know, whether you will witness and hear and it may only be a tiny snippet. It doesn't necessarily need to be a, you know, a full, um, what a full movement. But I wonder whether eyes and ears are, will be opened to hearing the melody of God in this coming week. Certainly something that I'll be um, thinking about myself. Would anyone else like to say anything before, before we move on to the last little bit? 
that was a really helpful conversation. It really, really was <laughs> really lovely. Um, okay, so let me just share my screen again. So something that we just touched upon there and which Kay reminded us of is that in this chapter, she poses the question of moving from mine to ours. And that reminds me that God is an ours. He's not a, it is a trinity. It is a relationship. God is a relationship. And there is no mine in God. Nobody's yet everybody's. And somehow our own lives are meant to mirror. We are the Imago Dei. So somehow our lives, we are relational, we are relational beings. Our, our truest sense, and it's written there in the new commandment, is to love our neighbor, is to love our God and love our neighbor, both of which are utterly relational. And so we move from mine to ours just by way of walking the Christian way. And so this led me to think about melodies in Advent. And we often speak of watching and waiting in Advent, but I wonder about listening and tuning in. Perhaps tuning in to the sound of an eternal God preparing his logos to enter temporality through the heartbeat of a baby, a heartbeat mirrored in one of those pulsars I'm sure you heard. Or what would it mean to listen for the secret rhythms of love that cut through the chatter and selfishness of a noisy world? The connection, the salvation, the liberation that breaks through every single moment if only we seek it. The sound of hungry hearts for truth, for peace, for love are all around us. And the triune God who sings, who dances, who creates and observes a rhythm, sends out his melody for the whole of creation to catch hold of through the seeking out of his breath, his wind and the spirit. And I wonder if anyone ever thought to write about such a thing.
So that is a modern composition, um, which was only recently put together by um, a composer called Rosa Faini Pipal in America. And what I was so struck about was the different way in which the Logos, the prologue to John's Gospel, was set to such a pace and a rhythm that changed and escalated and got lesser and began with classical kind of softness and then sort of picked up its pace as it went through. And so I wonder whether in the week ahead, considering this idea of the melodies of God, that we might just think about some of the things we've discussed this evening. There is, of course, the question of what is there in our lives where we need to move from mine to ours? And uh, that is a private question, a matter of your own uh, discernment and examination of conscience. And I leave that one with you. But I wonder whether we can attentively listen to our lives and to the encounters that we have with people in creation around us and notice where and how we might sense the strains of God's mighty symphony. And finally, I wonder, I would like to ask you all to simply read the first five verses of John's Gospel. You will hear it again at Midnight Mass, which is when we traditionally read it. So we traditionally read it just on the brink of celebrating Christmas in the church year. But actually, it is the prelude to the Incarnation. It is the moment as which God had an idea or God's plan gets to into his mouth ready for him to speak. It is the utterance of his melody. It is the composition of the true, the tune that we come to know in the incarnation of Christ. And so as you read John 1, 1 to 5, imagine what the music might be that sent God to send his logos into the world for all of us. And of course, on page 18 of the book, there is a lovely prayer, which you may use to set these reflections for the week ahead. And so what I'm going to do is to invite us to close with this prayer, which is a prayer of surrender to the divine, which comes from St. Catherine of Siena. Feel free to join in. Most Holy Trinity, Godhead indivisible, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, our first beginning and our last end. You have made us in accord with your own image and likeness. Grant that all the thoughts of our minds, all the words of our tongues, all the affections of our hearts, and all the actions of our being may always be conformed to your holy will. So may we, having seen you veiled in appearance here below, by means of faith, come at last to contemplate you face to face, in the perfect possession of you forever in heaven. Amen. So there isn't um, a gathering next week because I had something prior booked on the Wednesday evening, but we will come back together again on the 15th. If you wish, the, the chapter that I would have looked at next week, I think was chapter nine, um, which was called The Advent Hope, An Advent Hope. It's well worth a little look. Um, but actually the book itself, I'm reading each chapter first thing in the morning as part of my Advent journey and I'm finding it hugely, hugely rich. So if you are able to just put aside five, 10 minutes in the morning to just read what has been set for that day.
But the next time that we gather on Zoom will be on the fifth, Wednesday the 15th at seven o'clock, and we will look at chapter 17, The Costly Christ. And so I am just going to exit out of this. And please feel free to ask any questions or raise anything that we um, have chatted about here this evening. I can't hear anyone. Is that it? No yeah. melody whatsoever. Yeah. <laughs> Just thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you, Arwen. Thank you, Arwen. That's really good. I yeah. hope that was I hope that was all right. It's similar to last year. I, was, I don't know what I'll come up with next time, but um gosh, it's lovely, really lovely to think about this Ooh. with all of you. Thank you so much for coming and participating. Thank you. Lovely yes, to thank see you. everyone. <laughs> lovely thank to you. see you all. Good night. 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 Bye.